Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Curat, writer, and uh, this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2015 Christian drama film titled 90 Minutes in Heaven. Now, 90 Minutes in Heaven runs for two hours and one minutes long. It is uh, directed by Michael Polish. It is produced by Randall Emmett, Don Parus, George, can't see his name, Furla, Rick Jackson, Harrison Powell, and Timothy Sullivan. The script was written by Michael Polish, and it was based off of the novel, which was a New York Times bestseller, by the way, called 90 Minutes in Heaven. The True Story of Death and Life, and it was written by uh, Don Piper and Cecil Murphy. The cinematography was done by M. David Mullen, and the editing was done by Carrie Grease. And the stars of the movie are Hayden Christensen, who's trying to prove that there is still life after Anakin Skywalker in the old um, Star Wars prequels that came out in the late 90s, early 2000s. Hey, sometimes, you know, life goes on. You have to sort of take yourself out of the whole situation that nothing lasts forever, not even franchises, unless you're James Bond. Let's see, we also have Kate Bosworth, we have country star uh, Dwight Yoakam, Fred Thompson, we also have Michael W. Smith, Michael Harding, Rhoda Griffiths, and Marshall Bell. So even, this so even though this film looks like it's basically catering towards Christian leniency, it's lenient towards um, Christian faith. It probably might be more universal to all religious faiths, even though the leading character is a Baptist minister. The effort to tell the story on the memoirs of Don Piper, played by Hayden Christensen, and his experience into the afterlife is definitely more provocative than any other faith restoring adaptation that doesn't feel like it was like scribbled notes from a church attic. No, this was based off of a memoir. And although, yes, there's going to be some dramatic licensing to make things feel more like a movie than a documentary. It's still, you know, more effort was put into the script as opposed to just last minute changes and just, you know, jotting down notes on our restaurant paper napkin. Under the direction of Michael Polish, who has collaborated frequently with his own well, who frequently collaborated with his twin brother, Mark. This time he goes at it alone here as we explore the mystic stubbornness and determination that heaven is real and not a comatose dream of the day. Like the way Reverend Piper experienced. So in other words, this movie is just trying to do everything in its effort to make us think that, you know, that there is a heaven out there. And maybe it's just probably based off of our own, our own interpretation of what heaven is or what we would experience if there was a heaven. But this movie does everything in its power to make us think that there is a heaven. And that when you die, it's not the end. In fact, it probably might be the start of a dawning 
of a new chapter in your life, and that is living out the afterlife. What happens when you die? That is a mystery that we'll all have to experience ourselves when our time comes. I mean, we might be here a long time, but we're not going. But we're not here till eternity. So, based on a true story from the pages of Piper's book, 90 Minutes in Heaven, a true story of death and life, Piper recalls getting into a horrific accident in which he was dead for 90 minutes and believes that he truly saw heaven with his own eyes. In the movie, uh, I don't remember whether he was going to a religious seminar or was he coming home from it anyhow as he was driving home uh, a truck that was actually a stolen vehicle was led behind the wheel of a careless driver well it was of course the whole wrong place at the wrong time the truck crashed into piper's car leaving a car in complete uh, into a complete wreck while Piper was trapped inside the car and it was believed that Piper was dead for 90 minutes and while he was dead he um, claims that I went to heaven But he was dead on arrival. Now, by virtue of irony, in a rather unusual and somewhat cliche twist of irony, while the state troopers and the paramedics all pronounced him dead, suddenly a minister who happened to drive by shows up, some unknown minister, and he starts chanting some sort of a hymn which kind of revives him which is a bit of a cliche i mean here we have working experienced professionals like paramedics and 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 state troopers who couldn't seem to bring this guy back to the dead back back to life even if it was through mouth to mouth resuscitation or oxygen or whatever or whatever they couldn't bring him back to life but oh in a in a, in a s sort of a, a cliche this minister shows up and he miraculously sings a little hymn which suddenly brings Piper back to life and then the question that comes in mind is does Piper does mr. Piper want to come back to life or does he want to just forget about all the pain and suffering of recovering and just wave the white flag to die? Just so that he could be back in heaven. And this is kind of like where the, the meat and potatoes is in this movie because he is caught in the middle of this. I mean, there are people in heaven who have died before him who would love to re he would love he would love to reunite with and then there are the people who are down back here on earth the guys who are still with him who love him and care for him and hope that he somehow pulls through even through these hard difficult stages Well, he just doesn't seem to be very, very decisive. And that's kind of like what it is throughout this movie. However, though, praying, he was brought back to life and was revived through medical procedures. So this is based on facts with some dramatic licensing. Remember, the minister could bring him back 
while the more experienced trained professionals like the paramedics and the state troopers couldn't, there was, there's an example of dramatic licensing there. His experience is paced the way for him to become a motivational speaker as he projected his moments in the heavens above and to justify that there is life after death and that death isn't the end but the beginning. So in a way, maybe this movie wanted to try to make things comfortable just in case you're dying and you think that maybe maybe when you're dead, the world just becomes a complete zero, a complete blank, and that the rest of your life is going to be just a big, ba that, well, that a big barrel of nothing. I mean, it could happen that, you know, once you die, everything just shuts down, and that's the end. Or maybe some people who are just firm believers who believe that death isn't the end, but just the start of something new. I think this movie tries to do its justice to make us feel a little more comfortable when our time comes. Is it honest? I don't know. Nobody who, nobody who had died had ever told us what happens. We'll all have to find out ourselves. That's the mystery of death. And although, yes, people are afraid to die. But I guess maybe by saying that death isn't the end, probably might make the whole process of dying all the more comforting. It might be manipulative, sure. But who are we to judge? In terms of performances, Hayden Christensen and Kate Boss Bossworth were equally poignant in their respected roles, adding equal balance of chemistry that you seldom see in faith-based movies. And this works on several levels due to the stubborn nature of Reverend Piper's character as he quickly feels that coming back to life was more of a liability than an asset and that heaven was where he really wanted to go without realizing that the mortals back here on earth still love him and doesn't want to see him go. I mean, let's face it. I mean, he has, he has a wife. He also has three children who love him and care for him. He also has has his parents and his parents' in-laws who also love him very, very much. And then, and then, and, and this is where, where the biggest weakness is in this movie is that, you know, although, yes, it's trying to send a great positive message, one of the biggest weaknesses is that there are just way too many characters that we sometimes see a lack of character development within, I mean, just outside of, of Hayden Christensen and Kate Botsworth, there's so much, a whole bunch of characters that seem to just come in and come out, and yet we never hear from them again. And it just adds to more of the confusion. I mean, are these people like members of his parish, or it's just, or is it just a bunch of random strangers? I mean, maybe it's a possibility that Mr. Piper has has a lot of friends. I mean, that would not surprise me. He seems like a pretty decent fellow. But I would have liked to have seen more development in these characters and who are these people. I mean, they sometimes just show up just to give him some pep talk and then you never see them again. So then what was the point of these characters just walking into his hospital room, giving him a little pep talk, and then, and then you never see or hear from them again. I mean, they could have been just possibly random strangers. See, this is where the biggest weakness is. We gotta know these people. And another thing that also that many people might also frown upon is that 
well, this movie does tend to run at a very, very slow pace. And it also goes on for too long. Now, I'm not one of these people who moan like saying, ah, oh, it's too long. No, I, I, I don't do that. I don't pout. But at the same time, I think this movie should not have been two hours and one minutes long. Maybe an hour 45 as the latest. There could have been some scenes cut. There could have even been some characters taken out because they really showed little to no significance. And even, and even, you know, their children are very underdeveloped. I mean, his teenage daughter, all she cares about is, is wanting her father to come to her 16th birthday and dance with, and dance with her. I mean, even though she's supposed to be like 16 years old, she still talks like a 12 year old. Daddy. Could you come take me? Could you come dance with me on my birthday? Oh, sure. Come dance with you on your birthday. I'm in. I'm. I'm practically a fucking vegetable right now. What makes you think that by the time your 16th birthday is going to come around that I'm going to be able to walk again? Again, by virtue of miracle. It was a miracle that I actually am back here. When I should have just stayed in heaven and not have to worry about all this pain in the process of recovery. And all you care about is wanting to come and, and take me in for a dance when I can barely walk, when I can't even walk. My bones are broken. Look, you're a nice girl. You're a sweet girl and all that. And I don't mean to be abrupt or cruel, but Daddy is is not a hundred percent. So I can't. So uh, the only thing I could say is, we'll have to think about it. Okay, one day at a time. All right, one day at a time. It's a maybe, all right? Not a yes, not a no. I just wish there was more character development. It's really, really all that it kind of like just sums up to. The opening scenes were definitely were effective as we witnessed the scene of the accident and then looking at his family and the people involved in his life. Bosworth is equally effective in the movie as she may be facing the possibilities of raising her children on her own while maintaining her job as a teacher. Now, in some ways, you kind of feel a little bad for Kate Bosworth's character, too. I mean, yes, you do feel bad for, for, for Reverend Piper, but at the same time, too, Kate Bosworth's character, you also kind of feel her emotional pains as well. You know, seeing her husband lying in a bed all day, him stubbornly refusing to talk or refusing to even try and get better because he would rather just wave the white flag, surrender, die, just so that he could be reunited with the people in heaven, the ones who predeceased him, and that he didn't have to just, and that he could take the easy way out instead of just lying in a bed, suffering in excruciating pain. But, you know, you have to feel a lot of her stress and her pressures that seem to be also taken into great effect as well. I mean, the hospital bills are are, are piling up. Um, 
the mortgage of their house is also in jeopardy. The kids are spending more time at their grandparents' house, her parents. Everybody around them is all, you know, in angst and not necessarily grief, but worried. And though they are caring, but they're all still like strangers. You know, you know, you do feel bad for them. I mean, it's not just take. I mean, his, I mean, his his injuries and his pain and suffering is bad enough to watch, but the emotional side to her story is also just as effective. I mean, eventually they had to move away from their 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 house to move into a smaller, low-income, one-story house where he doesn't have to move a, move around as much. I mean, you really feel bad for them. And even if he does pull through, she will have to eventually become more nurturing towards him than she ever did before. I mean, you know, at one time, you know, the Reverend Piper was a very independent individual. But now that, you know, he's going to be in a vegetative state, now he's going to have to be under the watchful eyes of her. I mean, she's probably going to have to do stuff she may have did with her kids, and now she's going to have to deal with him as an adult, including cleaning his sheets, cleaning his bedpan, cleaning his clothes, because, you know, walking, learning to walk again, he's going to have to go through, like, like therapy to help restore him. And it's going to be difficult. I mean, it's maybe a little more easier to, to nurture a baby, but to nurture a full-grown adult like Don Piper, it's going to be, it's not going to be an easy road here. You know? She's going to have to do a lot of cleaning up for him. And it's not to say that, you know, she's going to start to treat him like a man-child. But at the same time, you know, when they tie the nuptial agreements, they have to be with each other through good times and bad and through sickness and in health. And even though the film is great as a simplistic story of finding faith, the midway point of the film tends to wear its welcome eventually. Though there is a humorous scene involving country singer Dwight Yoakam as his personal injury attorney, his determination in refusing to recover so he can return to heaven gets tiring after a while to the point where it just meanders. I mean, there are, are many, many scenes where he just simply doesn't want to try. And sometimes he even acts like a pouting, spoiled brat. And I don't really like to use the term of spoiled brat to a 38-year-old man. But unfortunately, if I have to, I'm just very well going to have to. Because that's what he's acting like. A spoiled fucking brat. I'm a nice guy, but, you know, sometimes I have to dish out a bit of tough love here and there. By the end, at the end of the movie, once he starts to become a little more mobile, 
and is able to walk, although he's still walking with a full bandage cast around his leg. He eventually does manage to move around about. And he starts giving out seminars. And he speaks about his, his incredible journey and the images we see featured here. But the way it was executed was very anticlimactic and quite unappealing. Oh, as a as a cliche, or maybe this is actually a reality, you know, like when we're on the brink of dying, you know, we see the white light. And you know, then over at the at the at the pearly gates, there's this whole big family reunion of all the people who have pre-deceased him. Some are old, some are young. And they're all out there, and they're all greeting him, and they're all happy to see him. And then he talks about his out-of-body motions, but it offers really nothing new to the premise. And it only just comes in at the end. Throughout most of the movie, he's pretty much lying in a hospital bed, going through all kinds of medical procedures. There's even this one scary scene, well, not like, horror film scary where a doctor uh, tells him about the only way is that his leg is like I hate to put it in blunt terms but his leg is like totally fucked up and that uh, the doctors told him that he's going to have to put on some big scary looking brace that Looks like the mouth of a Venus flytrap. It was this like big clamp thing. And that if he puts this clamp thing, this big, big ass brace, like like right between the legs, you know, it'll it'll help the uh, the bone structure to to come together. But at the same time, you know, it's going it's going to be a painful procedure. But by crushing the bone, the bones in his leg will be put back in place. And it could be the key to him keeping his legs on his body. And if he doesn't agree to that, well, there's always plan B. That's right, folks. Amputation. So what do you want to be? Locked up in the in the clamp? Or spend the rest of your life as a one-legged man? Choice is yours. So in spite of those minor shortcomings, 90 Minutes in Heaven stands out from those other films where it outreaches to the mortals here on Earth that heaven is real, where it doesn't feel forceful and doesn't just reach out to Christians, but those who can feel relieved that when you die, nothing gets shut down and that there is a place for the deceased in the afterlife. The many praises go out to the performances, and even though there are some underdeveloped characters, there, I mean, the, I mean, Hayden Christensen and Kate Bosworth do turn in some fine performances here. Uh, the cinematography was immaculately done by M. David Mullen, and the feel-good atmosphere depicted is as soothing as it gets so to you know to all those who are afraid of death you have every right to I don't think 
but it doesn't have to be scary. And that you know that when you die, you'll always have friends and family who will remember you forever. And, and that, like I say, death is not the end. It's probably only just the beginning. The beginning of a new chapter, the afterlife. And if you can look through that, maybe you probably might have your own 90 minutes in heaven. I mean, sure, wouldn't it be great to see what happens when you die? But it would be best if we just waited till that moment comes. And that we'll probably all just have to see for ourselves. It's unknown if whether or not this is true, that there is a life after death. But it's always a feel-good thing when you like to know that there is a possibility of hope and that and that when we die there is something for us so even though there is so even though this movie does have its share of flaws i still think that it does put its efforts into trying to make our lives feel a little bit better and make us feel a little bit better when our time comes up, whether it be a long time from now or a short time, at least we'll know if there is something for us when the time comes. So with all said and done, if I was to give a scale out of 10, I would probably give 90 minutes in heaven because there's, our, there's quite a bit of weaknesses but because of the efforts being put into this movie to make us feel good about ourselves, let's give it a six. So I guess this ends my writer review for this week. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Redwriter saying, keep watching those movies. And I'll see you around. Goodbye.